So thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Our speaker today is Mark Pauly, who's the Benheim Professor Emeritus of Healthcare Management at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Many of you will know him as one of the world's premier health economists. Some of you may also know him as an important theoretical innovator whose pioneering 1968 paper in response to Kenneth Arrow's paper kind of put moral hazard on the map for economists as a practical concept and uh, was extremely influential in the sort of thinking about what an optimal insurance policy should look like. But Mark is many things and he's also an empirical economist and he just told me he's also a regulation economist, which I didn't know. And he's going to be talking to us today about uh, some empirical and modeling work on the positive externalities of uh, fire insurance and special uh, and and its regulation with special reference to California. I'm going to be running Mark's slides, so you'll hear him ask me to advance the slides, which I will be very pleased to do. And I'll also be keeping the queue so you can uh, chat to me or raise your hand with the WebEx raise hand function. Before I turn the screen or whatever you call it over to Mark, I just wanted to say. Uh, alert everyone to the uh, fact that this is going to be our last uh, talk of the of the year. We're going to start up again next uh, spring with uh, Elizabeth Anderson, who's a very distinguished philosopher and sort of historian, who's going to be talking about uh, some origins of the conflict between private and social insurance. Um, please come back and join us. Uh, and thanks for coming and have a great break in the meantime. And Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks, Peter, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about this paper. Uh, I, I wanted to mention two uh, aspects of context at the beginning. First, uh, this is part of a uh, work with Howard Kunruther, uh, who has uh, retired as head of the Wharton Risk Center, Risk and Insurance Center, and has been my longtime collaborator for years and years. Yep. Uh, uh, Howard uh, is now battling cancer, but we started this paper uh, and the work on this before uh, before that hit, and we we both agree that this is the most fun thing we've ever done. So we've had fun at it, and I hope you will too, uh, trying to deal with this topic. But uh, the other three people whose names are authors are our intrepid team of uh, research assistants who put together and uh, constructed the simulation model, which was, uh, I guess, maybe you can teach an old dog. A couple of old dogs, new tricks, new for Howard and me, uh, and we think uh, shed some interesting light on uh, uh, both how to think about um, uh, uh, how fundament the fundamental question of how to de determine loss probabilities for purposes of of either evaluating or calculating insurance premiums, um, and also um, it made us feel very 21st century to be doing it, so we were happy to do that. Uh, the other point of context is, as uh, Peter mentioned, uh, I have uh, I've been an economist apparently since birth. I don't know when my kids were teenagers. Instead of telling them to go out and have fun, I would say go out and do something inefficient, which, if you think about it, is a kind of economic definition of fun. Uh, but um, uh, if, uh, and in particular, the regulation of insurance has always been an intriguing question for me. I'm not an expert on it, but I uh, uh, wonder about it and how it works and how it's supposed to work. There is um, a classic article by Paul Joskow at MIT, now about 40 years old, which I think r reflects the, the true economist predisposition, where Paul basically says, uh, well, if you make the usual assumptions about perfect competition among insurance firms and knowledgeable insurance buyers, there's nothing special about insurance that would require regulation. As usual, of course, that puts economists in an entirely different uh, sphere than uh, the rest of the world, where insurance is regulated in all of the states. And we're going to be talking about California insurance regulation here, uh, where uh, regulation, especially since the since the uh, position of insurance commissioner was made an elective office, uh, is pretty hands-on. So, uh, in in uh, in one sense, what uh, Howard and I are trying to do here is offer some help, along with the critique, perhaps, but mostly help to uh, insurance regulators trying to deal with uh, uh, insurer behavior when it comes to uh, writing coverage for. Uh, fire protection of houses in um, high-risk areas, what's called the urban wildfire interface here, 
uh, you can think of um, usually so far, thank goodness, they've been small cities uh, surrounded by uh, wild wildland areas where fire can spread. Uh, it's bad enough uh, that it burns up some of the piney woods, but when it spreads to the uh, more built up area, um, uh, of, um, not only do damages skyrocket, but but additional issues come into play. So, so that's sort of been the background here. So, uh, in one sense, we think we we may be able to uh, add something to the uh, a theory, um, and you can maybe tell me what it is about why we have insurance regulation. Of course, the general idea of insurance regulation is to protect consumers, but of course, the question is protect them from what. And uh, what uh, um, uh, comes into play uh, here uh, is partly the idea that uh, uh, even that in insurers' per a basis for calculating premiums may not be reasonable. Now, of course, that word uh, sends economists into t into a tailspin because we don't know what's reasonable and unreasonable, but we're pretty sure nobody else does either. Uh, but uh, but it it clearly is a um, a uh, uh, sentiment that uh, uh, ordinary people uh, want to have uh, taken into account by their public servants, and so we think it's worthwhile to uh, to consider. And then. Uh, as Peter mentioned, the other dimension that we picked up on here, because it turns out, at least in our story, and I think in real life to be important, is this idea of externalities, which is one of the uh, situations where markets do fail to achieve the optimal outcome. And at least in theory and economics, government, of course, a wise welfare maximizing government, not the government we actually have, but a government we might want to have, could step in. So that's the that's the background. And uh, I will now uh, uh, try to let you have as much fun as we've had. Uh, let's have the next slide, Peter. Well, so this is to convince you if you weren't already convinced that fires are bad. Uh, and uh, we started this paper uh, in 2021. So we picked up pictures from 2020 showing um, um, what I'll put on the slide in just a moment, that wildfires are uh, co common in California and uh, their correlation is not causation. But since we started writing this paper, they've been more and more common in California and much of the uh, West as well. So that's that's what this picture is supposed to convince you of. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, and this basically gives some of the kinds of uh, mind-numbing numbers that, uh, uh, if you weren't already convinced this is an important problem, would convince you. Uh, even in 2020, and these numbers in, tw in last season would be worse, uh, there were almost 10,000 fires burning millions of acres. Uh, there have, uh, of course, has, in the history of the U.S., been enormous forest fires that have been much bigger than the ones in California. Uh, even so, but uh, but th those occurred in periods of time when it was only forests that burned, not not uh, not houses. So this is uh, more uh, 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 potentially uh, harmful uh, to uh, society when these fires uh, uh, burn things. And uh, as we indicate there, there were. 10,000 structures, $12 billion losses in 2020. I'm sure it's higher la next, last year uh, that uh, are going on. Climate change, uh, Howard is very interested in the environment as am I, uh, will likely increase the likelihood and impacts of wildfires due to heat waves and drought. And a, a, another feature of climate change, which I should mention here is, as well, is that it, it, it also makes prediction an ability of anybody, insurer, regulator, uh, 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 or anybody on this earth uh, to predict what uh, damages will come from wildfires, even in total, but even, certainly in specific places, much more uncertain than has been true in the past. And so that uh, issue of how to uh, how to how to run an insurance company in the face of uncertainty about loss probability, and then how to regulate insurance companies trying to do do their best or maybe their worst, depending on your political point of view, when it comes to uncertainty about loss probability. That seemed to us to be an intriguing question. 
Uh, and uh, insurers have reacted to the changes that I just noted by increasing their premiums because fires are more common and damages are rising. Uh, in some cases, they've stopped, uh, individual insurance companies have stopped offering new coverage in high, high wildfire risk areas, presumably while they go back and calculate what premium they ought to charge. But uh, if you don't sell insurance, at least you can't lose money on insurance. Uh, and in particular, in, in high wildfire risk areas of California. And for the elected insurance commissioner, man uh, named Ricardo Lara, this has posed serious political problems because homeowners are obviously upset about uh, their insurance premiums taking big jumps or being canceled altogether. So next slide. Next slide. So this, uh, there's supposed to be two pictures here. There are, there is one. Oh, there, I didn't know we had a kinetic. Uh, okay, so this uh, is an example of damage, but also as if, if you've read the paper, you know that we use a, a data from this particular area called Fountain Grove, which is a suburb of Santa Rosa, California, where uh, fire damage uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in 2017 from the Tubbs fire was enormous. So all of those little white squares are the pads on which the um, um, actually very expensive houses, because this is in the hills overlooking Santa Rosa, never been there myself, but maybe I'm going to visit, uh, uh, all, the houses all burned down. So uh, uh, with, with uh, a few exceptions, which maybe I'll get to, there's a few anecdotes about how to keep your house from burning down. But uh, basically, it was a c catastrophic fire for that neighborhood, and we're going to use data from that neighborhood. So I wanted to show you that it was a real neighborhood. Okay, next slide. All right, so uh, the punchline here, I think most people could probably fill in already without me narrating it, but I um, also have an appointment in a medical school where the a rule is that um, you have, must read every word on every slide. I'll try to uh, violate that a little bit, but I will read some of these things uh, just to keep myself on track. So these wildfires have been spreading to built up areas and destroy homes. The Tubbs fire, which I just showed you, and probably people are more familiar with the campfire that destroyed the town of Paradise, California, <laughs> aptly named town. Uh, in California, the state regulates fire insurance, and, um, and in combination with local governments, there is some interaction, the building of structures. So we actually uh, want to talk about and think about, when we think about what government might do to deal with uh, some of the problems that we're going to discuss, not just the regulation of insurance, but also the regulation of land use. And, uh, and in particular, it's not all bad news here. California did pass about 15 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, a new building code that required uh, homes to be built of more fire resistant material. And research has already shown that, that those building codes did help to um, fairly significantly reduce uh, the uh, damage from uh, fires. It's a, I think, still not published paper by Bayless and Boomhauer. Uh, uh, great names for economists, I guess, but uh, published by the National Bureau of Economic Research that uh, where they uh, provide pretty strong evidence that um, that there was a real difference in the uh, uh, expected value of damage of homes that were built to the new code versus homes that were not. Uh, and so uh, the, the, tr the, thread, the trend of more common fires has led insurance companies to do things that uh, uh, that regulators certainly don't like, customers don't like, and insurance companies don't like, which is to refuse to sell insurance or to jack up premiums a lot. Uh, and, uh, 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 and so it's kind of a mess. Uh, uh, so that's basically what this slide says. The, the market at the moment is kind of a mess in California. There have been some task forces advising the insurance commissioner on what to do including some that our Wharton people have participated in, but it's still pretty much of a, uh, as far as I know, uh, 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 um, uh, um, uh, an unsolved problem. Next slide. So what's the policy? So the policy problem is that lar these large insurers are increasing premiums or declining to renew coverage 
in what they think are high risk areas and um, consumers, uh, for whatever reason, and I think you can think of the reasons who have been paying their insurance premiums faithfully year in and year out. Uh, well, it's bad enough. I mean, I've paid fire insurance premiums on my house for 60 years and I never collected a dime, uh, which of course could make me mad if I didn't understand the theory of insurance. But, uh, but, on the, but on the other hand as well, you think your insurance company ought to have some loyalty to you and not just uh, clear out of town when the going gets tough and yet that's what's going on in California. There is backup coverage. There's something called the California Fair Plan run by the state which will provide some coverage, but at high premiums, there's a, probably a backstory to the fair plan, which uh, exists in other states too, uh, w uh, indicating why um, consumers don't regard it as an adequate alternative to conventional insurance, but it does exist, and, uh, but it's more costly and less generous in coverage. And, um, and uh, oh, incidentally, there are also non-admitted insurers like Lloyd's of London, which I guess in principle could sell you insurance on your mansion in the Piney Woods in California, as long as it, the bill came in a plain brown wrapper and the insurance commissioner maybe didn't know about it or maybe allowed it. But, uh, but again, that's expensive and hard to get insurance. Um, here's the word reasonable based on past loss experience. But what's driving the regulators crazy in California uh, uh, is that, um, uh, uh, not just in California, but in many places, insurers are using proprietary simulation models or risk, as risk prediction models built on past data, I say here, but with inscrutable algorithms. All simulation models to me are inscrutable, and I think they actually are even to their creators. You never know quite what you put in, although what you get out, uh, you hope it makes some sense. But the, the uh, uh, challenge uh, in, in my uh, amateur understanding of this is that the traditional insurance review function, which asked insurers to submit data to justify the premiums they were proposing to charge, has uh, hit a glitch here because uh, for one thing, these models which develop uh, uh, estimates of lo expected losses on which premiums are based are often proprietary. So the insurer can tell the regulator, I'm not allowed to tell you it's all a secret. And even if they could uh, turn it over, it might not be understandable. And certainly uh, it, it would not be transparent. And if you were the regulator, you'd have, I think, a real challenge trying to figure out whether you agreed with, in a sense, or whether a reasonable person would agree with what's in the model compared to not. So, so homeowners and regulators both complain about a lack of transparency about premium increases, and particularly a particular point of um, of uh, 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 dissatisfaction on the part of citizens has been that they uh, uh, get angry because they put effort into trying to protect their property from, um, from fire damage by clearing brush. Potentially, there's a whole long list of things you could do, especially if you have a home that was built before the new building codes uh, to close off soffits, whatever soffits are and uh, to uh, remove the back deck or build it of concrete uh, that would help prevent the spread of fire to the structure. And insurers don't care about those things. They won't even come out and look, people say, at what I've done to protect my house, and they certainly won't give me a discount for all of this effort. And shouldn't you, insurance commissioner, require them to do that? So that's sort of the, what I understand to be part of the policy issue in California. Can I just quickly ask, why do you think that is? Why wouldn't insurance companies be eager to have you do some mitigation? Uh, well, uh, we'll partly get into that. Um, the uh, the um, uh, my authoritative speculation here is that um, they don't know um, uh, uh, um, uh, accurately how to adjust premiums for mitigation. Uh, I, I'm not, and I'm not sure how much this uh, story uh, uh, is, works, but um, th um, uh, to put a, put a more positive spin on it, insurers in response to this criticism 
are trying to take mitigation into account. But the other um, issue is one just of administrative cost, uh, the cost of going out and checking out each house for mitigation activities, which um, uh, at least um, on average probably wouldn't have made that much of a difference in uh, in uh, 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 loss probability may not be a, uh, a worthwhile thing to do. But um, but I'll, I'll leave that that's a question in my own mind of of kind of what's what's the uh, um, it's easy enough to define the problem. What's the optimal amount of attention that an insurance company ought to pay to mitigation activities, including the cost of determining whether activities have occurred and the cost of determining what difference those activities may make for loss probability? That seems to be a really interesting question and w why they've. Um, my impression is Howard and I have a semi best selling book called behavioral economics and insurance. And one of the things we talk about there is that uh, mostly it's about behavioral economics applied to consumers. You know, they don't buy flood insurance until after the flood and all that sort of thing that Howard's documented, but also uh, insurance companies faced with new risk prospects seem to I have a period at least where they hunker down and just say no to everything before they find maybe collect enough data or develop enough nerve to actually write coverage. Uh, that's a psychological theory, not an economic theory, but uh, that's the best I can do today. Okay, let's have the next slide. So our goal in this paper was to try to help out insurers by uh, help out insurance regulators rather, or help out the, the world in general being such noble people, we were going, we developed a simulation model which anybody can use. It turns out there's some competition here. There's an organization called One uh, Risk, I think, something like that, which also has a simulation model that anybody can have, although th we think it's not as good as ours. Uh, but we want to uh, develop a simulation model uh, that, uh, and here's where the economics comes in. We wanted to get a better idea from the simulation model be because frankly, we couldn't do this analytically of what the properties would look like of about um, concerning this, the probability that a structure would catch on fire, given in particular the proportion of neighboring structures that had been mitigated. So we tried to work up some simple models of that uh, analytically, didn't work, so we thought we'd build a simulation model. Uh, it turned out uh, there is a basis for such models and uh, some analytical work too, which confirms what we did, uh, taken from the other part of my own professional life, which is health economics. And it's the analysis of, um, of contag contagious disease, because if you think about it, catching um, COVID from your neighbor is not all that different than have your house catching fire from your neighbor's house that was unmitigated. Uh, the only difference is houses don't move around and people do, but so there are some differences, but that's the idea. So we wanted to uh, develop a simulation model that talked about uh, and, and gave us a better insight into how fire spreads in communities under assumptions parameters about uh, the likelihood of fire first hitting the town and then spreading within the town. And then secondly, economists always want to give advice to governments about what they ought to do for economic efficiency. Occasionally they pay attention. So we wanted to describe what would be socially optimal levels of costly mitigation. Uh, also try to uh, use some behavioral thinking to talk, think about likely owner investment in mitigation and actions to correct market failures because the uh, property that uh, your house can be damaged by your neighbor, a fire in your neighbor's house, or to put it in a more positive way, you can benefit if your neighbor will clean the brush away from his yard. That's an externality and economists like to think about externalities. So let's have the next slide. Uh, okay, well, so this is again telling you what we're going to say. So at the end, uh, you know what these economists are trying to say. Uh, we, we began with the idea, pretty obvious, that the probability of fire damage to a given property depends on neighbor's mitigation. That's not built into most uh, mo models out there, as far as we can tell, at least not as a variable. They will, of course, use data on 
um, how how frequently houses caught on fire from their neighbors' houses, but not on how it actually uh, works. And so our goal was to develop a transparent simulation model with plausible parameters that shows how fires spread within a community and affect the uh, expected damage. And then we were also interested in, uh, given that there are externalities, uh, what's uh, and thinking of mitigation as something that produces a positive benefit as you mitigate this external um, uh, risk or damage factor how does that curve behave that was basically our question and the usual textbook model here of a negative externality is um, something like air pollution uh, so you uh, the classic example is a um, a, sm a factory smokestack next to a laundry and uh, obviously the soot from the smoke makes it uh, more costly to do the laundry. Uh, the usual property is diminishing marginal benefit. So you put in the first set of scrubbers on the smokestack that provides the largest benefit in terms of reduction to the laundry. And then there's diminishing returns from there on out. Well, the, uh, the headline here is uh, we find a pattern in this model that doesn't look like that, that instead has at first increasing marginal benefit, reaching a peak and then declining. So that's what we were excited about as economists. Um, and then we want to try to translate that as much as we can into what might be messages for public policy. Next slide. Uh, so I think I've already said this. We did develop a simulation model that works, which was a great relief. Uh, uh, and um, I think I've said most of what's else on this slide. What turns out to be the case is that this model is very close to models of contagion, where you have this concept of herd immunity. Everybody heard about, heard about that in the time of COVID. Were we going to get there or not? Uh, it looked like COVID was so contagious. Obviously, the more contagious, the, the higher the probability of spread from one agent to another the higher the level of mitigation you need for herd immunity. So it turned out to have to be quite a high level for COVID. It, it's actually a fairly low level for some other things like mumps. Uh, it, just in case you wanna know whether uh, God always plays dice with humankind, sometimes it, it comes up favorable. But, uh, but um, it, it turns out the herd immunity concept actually provides a potential simplification for understanding what efficient behavior would be. And then um, we uh, uh, observe that uh, because mitigating my house provides benefits to my neighbor, there may be a, a case to be made for public intervention to get me to undertake mitigation even when I would not choose to do so voluntarily. Uh, but it will turn out, at least we argue, that insurance may actually be an extraordinarily good vehicle for getting real life people to engage in appropriate amounts of mitigation, both from a privately optimal point of view, but also from a socially optimal point of view. But as usual, there's a fly in the ointment here. The fly in the ointment is uh, what will turn out to be economically efficient, intuitive if you think about it, is you wanna protect the expensive houses in town uh, and, and uh, uh, but you don't want to protect every house in town, uh, just like you don't want to vaccinate every person because if the vaccination was fully protective, the last person's got nobody to catch the uh, disease from. So, uh, and it turns out the people, the houses that you would want to leave unmitigated are the houses, are lower, lower value houses, which arguably often are the houses owned by lower wealth people, which seem, may seem terribly unfair. But we'll talk about what fair, what's fair and unfair here when we get to it. All right, now, after all that buildup, uh, this is what I've already said, so you can read that, and we'll go to the model, I hope. Yes, so I have a, I have a cartoon version of this, but I couldn't get it to run. So this is supposed to show you how the mitigation model, uh, how our fire spread model works, rather. So here's a, uh, a neighborhood of 25 houses, uh, and fire hits that one on the upper left here, hits that house. Then um, fire from that house spreads to the two adjoining houses. 
and uh, and and uh, then um, f fire spreads to the adjoining houses. Uh, and then we go through uh, and then the, the uh, original house that's up at the top right, the fire goes out, so it turns black, but it's not going to burn again. Then the other fires go out, so they turn black, and we're going to run through these. Uh, let's have the next slide. Going from uh, top left to bottom right, more and more houses catch on fire, but more and more houses also burn up. And in a sense, the burned up houses act as a kind of fire break to prevent the fire from spreading to other houses in town. But it keeps spreading in this model until the next slide shows the end of the story. Uh, the fire goes out. Uh, and fire goes out with uh, more than half of the houses burnt, but they didn't all burn up. Uh, some of the houses still remain standing, which actually seems to be a pattern that occurs in fires, not so much the Tubbs fire, or the, uh, but in other fires where some houses burn, but some houses don't, more or less in a random way, although there are things you can do to prevent your house from burning. Uh, okay, next slide. As long as I'm talking about that, how to protect, I don't know whether anybody's thinking of moving to California or owns a property up in the woods, but uh, um, the ways to protect your house from burning are, first of all, to clear brush within um, uh, 30 meters of the house so that fire doesn't spread uh, on dead grass or dead trees from one house to another. Uh, replace your, eth your aesthetically pleasing wood shake roof with an imitation cement uh, wood shake roof, uh, replace your um, uh, log siding with uh, cement siding. And the best way to do it, uh, according to the, what we've heard, is to install a sprinkler system, which instead of sprinkling inside buildings, which we're used to, sprinkles the roof when and if a fire strikes. And the uh, anecdote that I wanted to save up to tell of uh, a neighborhood, uh, four or five houses that were saved from fire in Santa Rosa was because one of the homeowners commandeered a water truck that came by and forced, I, I don't know what persuasion was used, maybe some of it was of the green variety, but maybe some of it was not, forced the uh, 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 fire truck to spray water on the roofs of the houses and those houses survived that fire uh, uh, when most houses didn't. Well, uh, the simulation model that I just showed you generates predictions about the marginal reduction of burnt houses for various levels of separation. And this is uh, uh, one of the cases where the houses are six meters, uh, 18 feet apart, which is kind of reasonable. And what uh, we were pleased and uh, 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 to see is that the marginal benefit curve does have this um, uh, croquet wicket shape of starting off, starting off low, rising as uh, the, the intuition behind this is if if only one house in town mitigates, it doesn't really do much good for the rest of the houses because the fire will find its way around that one mitigated house. You have to get a kind of critical mass of mitigated houses together to stop the fire in its tracks before it starts to have an impact. And this uh, particular chart for the parameters that we used in the model, I didn't list all of them, but it shows that around 50% or a little less is the point at which uh, uh, the marginal benefit is maximized. So we think that's an important thing to know. It will obviously depend on the parameters of a model. If, if uh, fire spread like COVID, which spread like wildfire, if you pardon the expression, uh, it would be way out there to the 90% level. Uh, measles would do the same thing, just incidentally. But if it was, this is a kind of mump story here in our particular example. It spreads, but not that uh, rapidly. A and uh, the punchline is that if there was a um, cost of mitigation that society would have to pay of, say, C star, you could determine uh, what the optimal level of mitigation would be. It would be where marginal benefit equals that marginal cost C star. So, Peter, it's over there to the right, the rightmost point. So you don't want to stop 
when you're just getting when the things are just getting going good you want to stop after you've crossed the peak of marginal benefit it's on the downside you'd want to you'd want to order persuade cajole uh, incentivize uh, homeowners to mitigate in this particular example about 55 60 percent of houses uh, that would be the optimal level. It would still be true that the houses further to the right uh, would be efficiently left unmitigated and would be more likely to burn down if a fire did strike the town. But at least that would be the optimal level. If obviously, if the uh, uh, if the uh, cost of mitigation were higher at C minus D, you'd uh, 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 cut back on the level of mitigation. But uh, one of the interesting points that we thought. Uh, could be seen from this diagram is that whether C was at C star or was it C minus D, uh, it wouldn't matter all that much because you'd still want the op the level of mitigation to be about 55 to 60 percent. Now, if it went as high as C no star, you wouldn't want to mitigate at all because mitigation costs too much. It's better to let the houses burn down, rebuild them later, uh, or declare it a national monument or whatever you're going to do. Next slide. Okay. Next slide shows yep. the pattern uh, for various uh, uh, spacings between houses. And this is just to show you, but this was the fun part, I guess. You, as you can imagine, um, the closer that together the houses are, the uh, higher is the, the level at which marginal benefit, the higher is the percentage at which marginal benefit is maximized. When the houses are far enough apart, they're the lines down at the bottom where it doesn't really pay. You don't really care. You live far enough from your neighbors. You don't really care whether they mitigate or not. Okay, next slide. Oh, uh, and I think I've said all the things on this slide already. Um, for your edification, there it is written down. Next slide. Now the question is, uh, what about property owner decisions? And in the world where, which was the world of that model, where all houses were of equal value, it's more or less a random choice which houses get mitigated and which houses don't. But in the real world, uh, houses have different values. And so uh, we say what is obvious here, economics, of course, being just the science of making obvious things complicated, but we say you're more likely to mitigate for a given probability of fire spread if your house is worth more. So if you have a, a little log cabin uh, that your grandpa built, well, it'll have sentimental value, and that actually can turn out to be important for the insurance regulators. Uh, people want to hang on to those houses that have been in the family for years, but economically, it doesn't really pay to mitigate that one. On the other hand, um, you you uh, you will want to mitigate your house if it um, is built entirely of wood and it's the most expensive house in the neighborhood. You're going to need to forecast what your neighbors will do to decide on what to do yourself. And so uh, we thought of uh, trying to think about what what uh, is called a Nash equilibrium here or independent adjustment equilibrium. Um, it, it, it is not true that no homeowner would choose to mitigate, even if government did nothing, like Paul Joskow's article, even if government didn't interfere at all. If you own the biggest house in town, it still might pay, as long as mitigation is not super expensive, for you to mitigate your house without regard for your neighbors. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so we wanted to contrast uh, develop a little story and then contrast what you would expect to happen if owners in deciding to mitigate took only into account their private benefits to their property and and uh, and ignored benefits to um, neighboring properties compared to what would be the efficient thing to do which is to care about your neighbors not necessarily as much as you care about yourself the Bible doesn't necessarily apply here completely, but uh, at least care about them to some extent. So that's that's basically the way the model works. Next slide. The outcome, uh, so uh, again, probably not too surprising, but if there, there is a, if there is a stable Nash equilibrium, uh, and in some cases there will not be, I won't go down that rabbit hole with you because we'll never get out. But if there is a stable Nash equilibrium, it will be one 
in which the uh, owners of the most expensive houses choose to mitigate and the owners of less expensive houses don't for a given cost of mitigation. Uh, but for houses with a little below, with the values a little below the margin, um, you can see there's a potential efficiency gain because if you could get those homeowners who uh, would not quite um, get enough benefit from mitigation to cover the cost, but almost, if you could just give them a little bit of extra reward or punishment for mitigating, uh, then it may well be that there'd be sufficiently large benefits to the other unmitigated houses to cover in value terms the cost of the mitigation by those, let's call them marginal homeowners. So those marginal houses should mitigate, but may require, will require intervention to do so. And we illustrate these points by using a distribution of house values based on what houses were selling for in Fountain Value, Fountain Valley when we went on uh, Zillow or whatever the, uh, uh, thank goodness for the internet, whatever the, the uh, 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 real estate uh, listing site was in May of 2022. Uh, next slide. So this, uh, this is not the world's greatest slide because the print is pretty small, but a, a sort of simplified version of the distribution of house values that we found is up at the top there. They are, they're rebuilding on these pads some of the um, narrative that goes along with the house says it was built with fireproof materials. Sometimes they don't mention that and maybe makes you wonder a little bit about what the homeowners are getting into. But we constructed four tiers of house values based on more or less the average value or the range of values from almost $4 million houses down to tiny little, remember this is California, $750,000 bungalows. Uh, and so that's what table one tells you. Table two shows you the ex expected marginal benefit privately if you mitigated those houses at various tiers. And it shows you P star, P, star, P capital P star is the probability of a fire coming from the forest or the grasslands. What it shows you obviously is the expected loss from, uh, from uh, not uh, mitigating, the expected benefit from mitigating is much higher in tier one for the rich houses than it is down there in tier four, where it's hardly worth it to mitigate your house unless mitigation is super cheap. The last table uh, is a, an attempt to illustrate this sort of uh, thought experiment where um, we assume there's a cost of mitigation that would persuade people in um, tier one to mitigate. But, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, would, would maybe not persuade, uh, the cost is too high to make it worthwhile for the people in tier two to mitigate. But if people in tier two did mitigate, they'd get the benefits indicated there and they would provide the benefits to their neighbors in smaller, less valuable houses is indicated in the right, uh, the second column, the social benefit. And uh, it is uh, certainly if you made the cost of mitigation just a little below what it would take to get the tier two people to mitigate, there's going to be enough additional benefit from helping out their neighbors whose houses are not mitigated to make it worthwhile. So that's that's Mark, did you, that's the model. Are you, do, do you model neighborhoods where the rich houses are all together, or are you just assuming that no, the rich houses are sprinkled these in? These models so far, uh, my, our crack team is working on doing that because it turns out you can geolocate any houses. But here we we uh, we uh, we we scattered we scattered houses randomly, uh, <laughs> so you you could have a bungalow next to a mansion. Uh, they haven't torn down all the bungalows yet and built them up with McMansions in our model. Next slide. Insurance to the rescue. Well, to the rescue of what? For one thing, Howard and my work has shown, the, remember that best-selling book that you should add to your library shelf, that people, uh, consumers often don't uh, take into account the benefits from insurance. They have myopia. Uh, or the benefits from uh, things that would um, uh, affect their insurance premiums, 
like tying down your water heater so it doesn't roll around if you get an earthquake and other things like that. Uh, because they see concretely the upfront cost of doing so, but the expected benefits later on are hypothetical. They might or might not happen. We haven't had any of that kind of weather or that kind of uh, experience around here for years. So how to make these things more concrete. Uh, and one of the things that occurred to us was if insurance companies would be persuaded to offer discounts for mitigation, that would that step alone could lead to solving this behavioral economics problem because the homeowner would now just have to compare what's it going to cost for me to buy mitigation for my house, compare that with the discount that the insurer is going to offer me for mitigation, which would be based on those expected losses. And if the former is bigger, is smaller than the latter, uh, you know, it's a good investment, I'd go ahead and do it. So. Uh, so that would at least get around the potential um, uh, behavioral flaw. But to get to the socially optimal level, you need to go further than just what would be actuarially re uh, reasonable discount based on static values of loss probabilities for mitigated and unmitigated houses. You need to get people in that uh, marginal band to go further. So the solution strategy would be to bribe or require insurers to offer a larger socially optimal premium discount than what would be true based on um, uh, the difference in expected values in a static situation alone. Okay, so I think we're all, I'm almost ready to wind up here. Getting there from here. So there, uh, and I'd be interested in your ideas as well about ways to get there. Uh, th there is a, there is a, um, uh, 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 a potential uh, gain from um, uh, correcting the market failure here by subsidizing uh, uh, insurance uh, mitigation by the owners of medium value houses, because it will help out the uh, lower income or lower wealth people. I don't know, Bill Gates might have a small cottage in the woods, but uh, so wealth doesn't perfectly track house value. But uh, it could be good politics for the insurance commissioner, but um, uh, or it might not be. Uh, mandating coverage, I am the last living defender of the health in, individual health insurance mandate. Uh, so uh, I know mandates don't always go down very well, and it might not go down very well here. Requirements to protect your property might work, but, but they should be administered if, to be efficient unequally, meaning you should mitigate your property if it's high value, but we shouldn't require you to mitigate your property if you live in the trailer park or if you have a low value home. And building codes of help but are not targeted. I think, is that my last slide? Let's see what there is. There's a conclusion slide, I think. One more. I think... Last slide. That's it. Oh, that's it. So yep. anyway, uh, I guess that is the conclusion. So uh, I will say just uh, uh, one last thought, and then I have to stop talking. Um, is there a way, <coughs> insure, uh, Ricardo Lara does not have a money pump that he could turn on to generate subsidies to increase mitigation from privately optimal levels to socially optimal levels. Is there anything he could do? Well, of course, you could think of um, uh, uh, making transfers uh, <coughs> by raising premiums above their actuarially fair value for some homeowners and using the excess to subsidize uh, the uh, premiums for those owners that choose to mitigate and that you target to be efficient. But they will, of course, be the owners of the marginal houses, not the owners of the lowest value houses. Their houses efficiently should burn down. And, but oh, the good news is you, you also aren't subsidizing Bill Gates's house uh, if it's a mansion, because that doesn't need a subsidy. They would mitigate anyway. So the subsidies are uh, ideally targeted to this middle band, but uh, that may be a challenge. Uh, and uh, so the question is, uh, uh, of course, uh, California could, uh, the state could devote some of its outrageously high income tax funds, which I think they're refunding anyway now, uh, 
uh, to uh, subsidize uh, mitigation of houses in high risk areas, but that may be a difficult political challenge. So uh, uh, economists get out of town when we start talking about politics. We've told you what ought to happen, and um, now the, the rest is just up to, um, uh, uh, to politics. All right, Travis is going to keep the queue. Uh, so, Travis, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, so, Tom Baker's on the queue. Hey, Tom. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you on Zoom. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, my question is really, what's what's next? I mean, it it it, it all makes a lot of sense, um, and you know, I, and and the but, but, you know, but what, like, if you can ma wave your magic wand, what, what would you do next? Uh, well, I, I think my, it was not entirely uh, uh, frivolous to say it, it, it might make sense for the state to, uh, which, which has the money, m maybe local governments have the money, but uh, for the state to um, uh, subsidize, uh, uh, essentially subsidize mitigation. Uh, I think what our work shows is you don't just want to subsidize mitigation willy nilly, uh, um, even though that's how we usually subsidize things, right? <laughs> like electric cars and so forth, regardless of if the, I guess we, I guess you get a subsidy for your electric car, even if you're in the middle of Montana, which is not really the efficient place to subsidize electric cars, but uh, but in the ideal economist world, you would have targeted subsidies to the uh, 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 to the insurance uh, discount for uh, owners of um, uh, those marginal properties. Or <clears throat> Ronald Coase won the Nobel Prize in economics for pointing out that whenever there are externalities, there's always on the other hand. You can either require, in a sense, the beneficiaries of the subsidy who actually are the owners of those low value houses to subsidize the marginal owner owners or you could require the owners to uh, mitigate themselves as a building code kind of uh, rule so that's what we thought of as sort of the simplest brute force answers there are two other answers but they uh, both involve monopolies, so we recoil in horror a little bit. But one is, which actually happens, if the community, if the neighborhood is built by a single developer that builds in all fire-resistant houses, those houses ought to sell for more, <clears throat> assuming the cost of fire resistance is not too high, than uh, houses in other communities that are not built according to the same specification. So if all the houses in the planned community are fire resistant, that would be where, unless you were a fire bug, you'd want to live. The other solution is a little bit harder to think of, but it would be possible to think of raising the premiums on owners of low value houses, which of course makes people nervous. Uh, use that money to subsidize the discount for those marginal houses. But the consequence of doing so should be to lower the base premium for the owners of the unmitigated houses by more than enough to compensate them for the transfer that they've made from poor to rich or from poor at least to upper middle class, if that's what's going to be going on. So that's what we've thought of. But any other ideas, uh, either let us know or let Ricardo Lara know, because I'm sure he's interested in what the solutions might be. Peter Siegelman. All right, so um, did you explore, it seems like the, the mitigation that you have in mind is sort of moving the house. And I'm wondering if that makes any difference, whether uh, other kinds of mitigation might look different. It seems like uh, moving a big house in some sense or not building a big house is, is harder than say, putting a sprinkler system on your roof. No, I I we th I th I'm, let me interrupt you there, Peter. Sure, no. I did. We were thinking more of houses staying put and what people might do to mitigate them. You're right, of course, the ultimate solution to avoiding having houses burn up when the piney woods catches on fire is not to build houses in the piney woods. Mm. And if they're there, to move them away. But of course, there's aesthetic benefits from living close to nature. And 
I'm going to pay um, thousands of dollars next week for a giant um, tree that overhangs my house but is dropping branches at a rapid rate. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and my wife, we're going to have a little funeral for the tree because <laughs> it's older than the house, which is 120 years old. But, uh, th but those, those are the breaks uh, more, in more ways than one. So we're thinking, we're thinking though of mitigating, mitigating houses, and there is some tricky business here, or some interesting business about what does it cost to mitigate. It turns out, uh, uh, at least what we're told is, ignoring aesthetics, it may actually be cheaper to build a fireproof house than a house with wood shingles and wood siding <laughs> and so forth. If you make it all of concrete, uh, that can be cheaper. On the other hand, retrofitting an older house costs about 60 grand and you still have to clear the brush each year. So uh, we, we have yet to become experts on, you know, the relative cost of various kinds of mitigation. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, you didn't. Uh, uh, that was very responsive. Uh, did you explore at all or could you explore whether some very crude second best thing like you have to spend, you know, 1% of your house value every year Would that you know, so that means that probably the rich might over in your in your story, the rich might over invest, maybe the poor would under invest. But since the middle seems to be where you're worried, and if you targeted it so that that worked out basically right, whatever the percentage would be, does that seem well, like a could explore possible that. thing? Or you could, it, it, it's, it's not first best efficient to mitigate yeah. all houses, but it might be better than not mitigating any houses. And in fact, in some of our numerical simulations, it turns out that's true that, uh, the, the net social benefits uh, or the, the, the losses, I guess, the best way to describe it, start out high when nobody mitigates. They go down, reach a minimum, and then come back up. But in most of the models that we've played with so far, uh, if you mitigate everything, you don't come up to as much damage as you started out with. So there could be in between cases. That makes the case for having a good simulation model that can t t allow you to do those experiments uh, uh, quickly, but it seems like a sensible thing. Uh, I don't have a, a strong intuition about, uh, well, which second best approach would be, <laughs> sec be, be best of the second best. Um, so I might hop on the queue myself. This is, a, I, I think, a follow-up to Peter's question. Um, so. I, in terms of thinking about the marginal benefit of different of investing in different things to combat the effects of forest fires, I mean, mitigation seems like one obvious thing to invest in, but firefighting would seem to be another one. And I realize that might complicate your model to a crazy degree, but I mean, in this, in the context of this group, it seems sort of particularly apropos because, as as you know, the the origin of firefighting was that it was funded by private insurance companies. Yeah, yeah. Well, in Philadelphia, right. So I, I have to know that, yeah. But so what would it look like anyway? I mean, like, is that is that if you were to introduce into your model, the mar you know, the benefit of investing in firefighting? Uh, by insurance companies. By insurance companies or otherwise, I mean. Well, uh, otherwise, yeah, uh, uh, um, the town of Montecito, which is apparently one of the richest uh, areas in California, uh, uh has done that they've they've invested an enormous amount in firefighting and in building codes and, and uh, 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 and then um, there there are um, stories about uh, uh, when a fire approached Montecito it didn't burn it didn't burn up Montecito now it's Montecito is near Santa Barbara and one of my best friends is in in, uh, in the econ department at Santa Barbara and he said, that fire was going out anyway, just before it hit Montecito. So it wasn't really their fire protection that did it, but they took a lot of credit for fireproofing their community. Yeah, so there's some kind of giant optimization problem here where you would, uh, in principle, gather data on the relative cost and effectiveness of all the different ways of reducing damage and solve the programming problem that would tell you the optimal mix. Um, so uh, that'd be a good, PhD thesis for somebody. I thought you were volunteering to come back next week with the answer. <laughs> no, no, yeah, we're not going to do that. Great. And so uh, we have Jennifer McAdam with uh, what may be the last question, unless we want to stick around a little bit longer. Thank you. Um, so I was just looking at your um, conclusion slide, and one of your thoughts was 
to mandate insurance coverage. And I'm wondering if you could explain that a little bit more. What kind of insurance coverage are you talking about mandating since most people, I would imagine, have homeowners insurance coverage? Are you talking about like a fire specific coverage? Uh, well, here, that was poor choice of words. What I really meant was mandate, uh, mandate mitigation. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, so that, Sorry, that's what I really meant there. Uh, 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 I mean, in a sense, mitigation is a kind of insurance, but <laughs> I, uh, I was really thinking of mandating mitigation. Oh, I might have for health that. for healthcare, though. I'm in favor of mandating insurance coverage, uh, um, and it, 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 the day may yet come. Okay, on that cheerful note. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming okay. and for explaining all this right. to us. Uh, it was a real pleasure. And come back when you've when you've solved all these problems. All right, we'll do that. Okay, this life or the next, Peter. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Uh, bye.